Okay, um, so I'm not quite sure what to expect, but I uh, just thought I'd ask first, does anybody uh, doubt that HIV causes AIDS? Okay, in that case, I may as well go home. <laughs> um, okay, maybe at the end of the talk, people might doubt it, which might mean I've completely failed. Um, this maybe is a blazing, yeah, okay. So um, I will still go through it because you might be asked and you might have to defend it sometime. Um, and I'll start with the question and <coughs> say, well, it's fine to be skeptical. In fact, it's good. Um, but you must be prepared to change your mind. Um, if you don't change your mind, you're, you're really denying it. And, and this can be a problem. So there are three... Uh, very prominent um, denialists, or dissidents, as they call themselves. Um, so this is uh, Peter Duisberg, um, who's a professor of chemistry at Berkeley in California. And he um, discovered oncogenes, really. So, so he did some really good science back in the 70s. And um, is a member of the National Academy of Sciences of the USA. And he is the first one who really um, was first skeptical and then became a denialist, in my view, uh, about uh, whether HIV causes AIDS and sort of bucking the trend, painting himself as a kind of Galileo. And I'll go through the arguments he raises. Um, he is supported by this guy called Kerry, Kerry Mullis, um, who invented the polymerase chain reaction, PCR, uh, working for a company called Cetus in um, the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and that is a brilliant technology that um, anyone who works in the lab uses. And it's the basis, really, the fundamental technique that everyone doing any molecular science these days uses. Um, but he's also a bit of a crackpot. <laughs> and um, this is being recorded, isn't it? I'll get sued. Okay, so anyway, that's him, but he supports this. He's a, you know, these guys are chemists, and, and I'm nothing against chemists, but sometimes they, they don't know too much about medicine. Um, this one is Talbo Mbeki, who was the president of South Africa. Um, and he, I think, was surfing the internet one night and um, came up uh, on this AIDS denialism. And there was a big problem in South Africa. A lot of people with AIDS, and <coughs> he refused to believe that HIV was the root of it, and that this was all some kind of uh, Western imperialist plot to sell more drugs, and to um, say things are bad things about South Africa and, and black people in particular. Um, so these three uh, have met, I think, on a number of occasions. And um, they've uh, caused a lot of trouble. So what are their arguments? Um, so these are all kind of quotes from these people, um, mostly from, from Duisburg. Um, HIV does not fulfill Koch's postulates, and I'll tell you what those are in a minute. Um, the, the two things, HIV in, in the blood, um, and uh, AIDS are just correlated. And with correlations, you never know which is cause and which is effect. So you may have, you, the argument, their argument is you might have HIV because you're immunosuppressed. <coughs> and then it's a sort of carrier that, that you acquire. Um, HIV infects only very few of the target cells in the blood. These are, I'll come to these in a minute. These are CD4 T cells. And it infects so few that it, how could it possibly deplete them? It's quite a good question, actually. Um, but they put that up the front and say, you know, it couldn't, couldn't possibly um, be how HIV causes AIDS. Uh, not everyone with HIV has AIDS, they say. AIDS is caused by the drugs used to treat the infection or indeed the drugs people take for recreational purposes. Um, AIDS is a different disease in Africa from the West. In the West, it's a gay disease. Um, it's caused by the lifestyle and mis especially misuse of drugs. <coughs> um, 
It's caused by, or is a myth created by, the CIA, President Bush, President Clinton, President Reagan, the pharmaceutical in industry to boost the sale of their drugs, or anyone you like to suggest. Um, the one I like is the CIA. I mean, the CIA are just not clever enough to create this virus. Um, you know, we, we'd be in dead trouble if they were that clever, but they aren't. And, Bush, Clinton, and Reagan certainly aren't smart enough to make this virus. So there are, there are even some more sort of crackpot ideas, and this, this was more in the early times, but this is um, from a newspaper in Uganda which had a big problem, and actually the president of Uganda um, has been very active in, in educating people about it. <coughs> and he, <coughs> he, had, he had to educate in 1996. Uh, men were accused of sleeping with fish, as this uh, disease caused um, wreaked havoc amongst Ugandans. And there's something about the fish in the Irish Sea, which are important here. So there were some really wild notions out there. So the dissidents claim that the hypothesis doesn't fulfill Koch's postulates. So, so Koch's postulates were... Uh, raised at the end of the 19th century to um, to address the question whether mycobacterium tuberculosis causes TB. So, but at the time it was a similar kind of problem. Um, and <coughs> they proposed that to be able to prove that that bacterium causes TB, and in this case HIV causes AIDS, you should be able to isolate the organism in every case. You should be able to propagate it by culture in vitro. You then reproduce the disease by injecting <coughs> the organism back into a suitable recipient. This obviously is a problem with HIV. Um, and then from that recipient, re-isolate the organism and go around the whole cycle again. And for TB, that TB fulfills those. Um, so they raised this. Now, I think no one had really thought about these since they were at medical school and they just learned old-fashioned bacteriology. But um, Duisburg raised this as a big problem. So can HIV be isolated in, in every case? Um, well, in my view, it can. Um, although some in other immunodeficiencies may look a bit like AIDS, although not much. Um, and there would be negative for HIV. Of course, they argue that there's a circular argument here that um, we define the disease as something occurring in people who are HIV positive, and therefore everyone who has the disease must have HIV. Um, but <coughs> the fact remains that every case has the virus. Um, you can't really culture it on its own because it's a virus, but you can grow it in cells. Um, and you can purify it. And in fact, the next slide just shows you the virus budding from a cell line, and you can purify these virus particles. Um, so you, the virus exists, and actually Duisburg doesn't deny that it exists. <coughs> Three and four, well, clearly it's not ethical, um, but there were, unfortunately, two accidental lab infections in, in a lab in the USA. Um, and they went on to develop the symptoms of AIDS, and I think they were treated in time to save their lives with the drugs. Um, but they accidentally and very unfortunately um, more or less fulfilled this criterion. And I guess they could get the organism out of those patients. Um, if you move into chimpanzees, um, which are obviously close to humans, and these experiments aren't done very often, and I'll come back to this in a bit later. But you can inject it into chimpanzees. Mostly they don't get infection, and I'll discuss that later. Um, but at least in one animal, AIDS has been caused, and so it fulfills three and four. So then they say it's a correlation, so it's not necessarily causal. Well. HIV positivity precedes development of AIDS. So AIDS is acquired immune deficiency. So this is susceptibility to infection with um, T 
TB, another mycobacteria, to um, uh, pneumocystis, which is, was a problem, it's a the protozoal disease um, that caused problems in humans, um, fungal infections, yeasts, etc., um, and many other things. Um, but patients are infected with this virus before those things happen. So if you follow people longitudinally, you see this first and then these problems. And this is true in babies, in hemophiliacs who had contaminated blood products, in people who've had rare now, fortunately, blood transfusions, um, uh, well, it was contaminated blood and then <coughs> became infected, and, and in sexual transmissions. And if you look at population studies, in various countries, uh, particularly if you're following it in, say, India or China, um, then it, it, HIV appears in the population before you start seeing deaths from AIDS, if you're monitoring carefully. Um, so all AIDS patients have HIV. Um, then there's a, they, they argue, and there was um, a pretty scurrilous um, series of articles in the Sunday Times um, edited by Andrew Neal, who is quite respectable these days. Um, but at that time, he was the editor of the Sunday Times. And there was a journalist called Neville Hodgkinson, uh, who talked about the myth of the African HIV epidemic, saying that um, there were lots of people who had HIV, and particularly babies, and they didn't have AIDS. Well, it takes 10 years average from becoming infected to develop AIDS. Um, and there's no mystery about that, and there's nothing unique about it. But it means that not all HIV-infected people have AIDS, if you look at them cross-sectionally, if you look at them now. Um, but if, you don't, if they're not treated, they will almost certainly develop AIDS. And they may take two years, five years, 10 years, 15, 20. There are some maybe even longer than that. And again, all AIDS patients have HIV. So this is the sort of picture of the virus uh, infection. This is the virus in the blood um, from infection. And about three weeks after infection, uh, it peaks in the blood at very high levels, about a million copies of virus per one cent cubic centimeter of blood. Um, then it sort of comes down, and then it wobbles around. And this is patients, they may have some symptoms here, flu-like illness. Um, here, they're asymptomatic. And if they're untreated, um, this period may last anything between less than a year to more than 15 or 20 years. But eventually, they, the virus will start rising again in the blood, and uh, they will become immunodeficient and have the AIDS-defining illness, and if untreated, uh, would die. So that's the pattern of, of the infection. Um, so. Then they say, well, HIV infects only a tiny proportion of CD4 T cells, so how can it deplete them? And, and actually, this was a good question, because if you look in the blood of an HIV-infected patient in this sort of period, um, you will find that perhaps only one in a 1,000 or one in 10,000 of the target cells, which are the uh, lymphocytes, as white blood cells, that are divided into two types, CD4 and CD8, depending on the presence of these molecules on the surface. And uh, CD4 T cells, there's normally about <coughs> probably half a million or, or a bit more, 700,000 uh, per mil of blood. Um, and uh, these, only, a ti on, only perhaps one in 10,000 of those are infected <coughs> with HIV, or one in 1,000 maybe. Um, so it is actually quite hard to, to explain, if that's true throughout the whole body, um, how um, the virus could deplete so many cells. But, it, in fact, it's not true, because more recent evidence, and this is about five years ago, um, looking at the gut, and um, in the lining of the gut um, live more than half of all the lymphocytes in your body. So you've probably got more than 10 to the 11 lymphocytes. So, so you've got this um, whopping great number in your of lymphocytes in your whole body, and about more than half live in the gut. And they're doing a great job there, because the gut, if you think about it, 
It's full of microorganisms. I mean, there, there is more bacterial DNA in your body as you stand here than actually your DNA. Um, so you're full of these these bacteria, which um, could cause havoc if they weren't if they actually got into your bloodstream. Um, and occasionally they can get across, but then there's immune responses in the gut deal with it. Um, so it turns out that, that in acute infection, this early infection, 20% of these cells are infected. And furthermore, um, about 80% of them get very activated. And lymphocytes, when they get activated, often die. So if they're activated by foreign antigen, foreign material, they're activated to do their job, and then they kind of disappear. But if they're activated in some non-specific way, um, they could die and be depleted. And this is called bystander activation. And one cause is probably leakage of gut bacterial products. There's something called lipopolysaccharide, which uh, is very stimulatory to lymphocytes. And that's common in the walls of bacteria, and it gets across, and it can activate the cells. And there's probably a whole load of other things that we don't know about. And this is at least one reason why there's such sort of havoc going on in the guts of these patients during acute infection. Um, so what you have, I think, on this slide, yeah, is during acute infection, this is the virus, there's a little blip of loss of these CD4 T cells in the blood. Um, so the normal level is seven or 800, say and it might dip down to about 500 per, per mil of blood. Um, and then it comes back up after the acute phase of infection is over. And then it stays up, but it gradually declines. And that's just what the clinicians follow in, a, in patients to see how they're doing. So when they get to, currently when they get to about 50% of the normal level of, of about 350 per mil of blood, um, then they'll consider treating them if they've been asymptomatic up to that point. But if they aren't treated, then it will just carry on declining until they get this uh, collapse of everything and develop AIDS. But if you look what's happening in the gut, they're going way down in this acute infection. And they remain low in, in the gut they're on. So there's a lot of T cells lost that you don't see in the blood, there's sort of compensations that are <coughs> putting them back in the blood so they're circulating around, um, but the total number is, is depleted. So it was a good question that Duesberg raised, but it has been answered, and I think um, you can't use that as an argument that HIV cannot deplete these um, cells in the blood or in the body. So then they say the drugs cause AIDS. So the anti-HIV um, drugs, um, the AZT was the first one, and that, that um, blocks um, synthesis of DNA. So it's called Terminator. <coughs> and it does have side effects. It, it was originally made as a cancer drug to, to stop cancer cells growing, and it, it can stop other cells growing. And it's, they suggested this, this was actually causing AIDS, so putting people on drugs was only making things worse. Well, it's become clear that actually the drugs really do work. So their first use was, um, that was clinically useful was using them to prevent mother-to-baby transmission. So one drug, so before there were three, or well, there are now about 30 drugs, but before there were that many, um, the first one, AZT, if that was given to the mother at the time of birth, the mother was HIV positive. Um, if you give it to the mother at the time of birth and during that sort of birth period, <coughs> uh, it reduced the transmission of virus from mother to baby by about half. And there are now better drugs and better regimes that will reduce that down um, ex to extremely low levels. The baby may then acquire um, the virus from breastfeeding um, but there are now regimes to prevent that happening as well. So this has been a, one of the great success stories that can and has been applied in Africa. Uh, not universally, but it could be. Um, and that, that terrible scenario of um, orphan babies dying of AIDS um, 
is, you know, could be ended. Um, and Becky didn't help that because he said you didn't need it. And he had a crazy um, health minister who, who even said you should use extract of beetroot and things like that instead of these drugs. And, of course, they're useless. <coughs> so uh, that, to me, says that the drugs work, that this virus is causing AIDS and you can prevent it with the drugs. Um, but even better than that, if you look at uh, what's happened in the death rates in Western countries, uh, and I'll show you the graphs in a minute, you see the introduction of the effective treatment regimes has greatly reduced the death rate from, from HIV infection. Um, and there's even more recent news that you can actually prevent infection where you have, say, a, a couple, um, who may be man and woman or man and man, or, um, where one is infected and there's a high risk that he or she may pass this on to the partner, that if you um, treat either the um, infected person or the partner uh, with the drugs, you can dramatically reduce that infection rate. But this one is, is I think, one of the most dramatic things that um, is perhaps the most convincing single piece of evidence, really, <coughs> that there's what's happened to AIDS mortality. So um, this is uh, total mortality in HIV-positive people in the United States that uh, in the mid-'90s had reached 50,000 deaths a year. Um, the two graphs are um, actually caused by HIV and AIDS, and these are deaths in the, in the group of HIV-positive people. There's little differences, deaths from other causes. <coughs> so in come the drugs. Now, the drugs initially, they were the first ones were available back here, but one drug doesn't work because the virus quickly... Um, mutates to become resistant, as, you, as happens with penicillin, so it's uh, the same kind of thing, that uh, it, it develops resistance, uh, mutates and escapes from the drug, um, and then the treatment no longer works. But it turns out that um, if you use three drugs, and there are, there are now more than 20, um, and so various combinations of the three drugs, <coughs> then it's very effective. You, you reduce the amount of virus in the blood, and you don't get, as long as the patient takes the drugs, you don't get <coughs> these escapes and resistance. So look at what happened with the mortality. It sort of came down by about two-thirds, um, just in a very short time, and is, is now um, like really quite low levels. And, I, uh, and if you look at the uh, 25 to 44-year-olds in the USA, <coughs> Um, the fall is even more dramatic. And just in case you're thinking, well, there's been some medical miracle and everything's getting better, these are death rates from other things which have not really changed in this period. <coughs> but this one has been dramatic. And in fact, in this age group, from being the leading cause of death, has become uh, still a significant cause of death, but, but much lower than many of the things that... Um, we know about being the USA, homicide is quite a big factor. <coughs> so that has to be the drugs. I, I can't think of any other possible explanation that could do that. <coughs> um, so then they, they made the argument, well, Africa's different, and um, this is a Western disease. It's, it's a disease of gay men in, in the West. Um, and uh, in Africa, uh, it's a disease, uh, whereas in the West, it, there's many more men infected than women, uh, whereas in Africa, it's actually more women than men infected, although it's roughly equal. And the argument uh, that um, Mbeki liked, I think, was that it's always been there, and it's a problem of poverty, and that was caused by Western exploitation, um, and... Um, you're now foistering these drugs on us so that you can make big profits for your drug companies. Well, um, if you look at life expectancy in African countries, um, <coughs> it was rising nicely in these, all these countries uh, 
through the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and then in the 90s it plummeted. And at the same time, you had the rise of HIV in these countries from lowish levels. These are numbers, percentage of the population. These are often tested. You can't test millions of people, but if you test, for example, women coming to antenatal clinics, um, so they're in the at-risk age group and they're obviously sexually active, um, then these are the sort of numbers you got, that it was sort of one less than 1% in South Africa in uh, the early 80s, and then it gradually increased <coughs> and got up into the 20 to 30% level in uh, Botswana and Zimbabwe, and actually in parts of South Africa. So this was happening, and this was happening at the same time. Now, you, you have to be go through some incredible mental acrobatics to say the two weren't connected in any way. Um, so on Afri in Africa, there are still some issues. So um, if it is a new infection, where did it come from? Why, why did it come into humans um, quite recently? Um, where, and where did it start? So did it start, it was first picked up in the United States um, in 1981 um, as causing immune deficiency and the virus was isolated in 83 uh, in Paris and then in the USA. <coughs> um, so did it start over there and then did, they, did it come from there to, the, to Africa? Well, if you look at the, the viruses, um, if, you, if you sequence viruses, so you sequence the nucleic acids in the viruses, and it's a very variable virus, this. <coughs> so, so each virus sequence is here, and then the next one closest to it is here, and the one closest to that is there, and so on. And these distances represent roughly how many mutations it would take to get from there to there, or from a common ancestor here to develop to that and to that. And if you do that kind of analysis, which you do from these sequences, and you just do it in computer programs called phylogenetic tree analysis, um, you see it clustering. So there's a cluster here, 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 and so on. So this is what we call the B subtype, or the B clade. And that is common in the West, in the Americas, and in Europe, a little bit in Australia. Um, this cluster here, D and uh, A, are common in East Africa. This one, C, which actually is now the, the most um, major, the one we're affecting the most people in the world, um, is in Southern Africa and also in India and parts of China. And they're quite distinct. Um, the, the first virus isolate ever was from 1959, um, which was from a, f a frozen serum sample that was in Kinshasa in the Belgian Congo, well then, as was the Belgian Congo here. And actually, if you look in this sort of uh, equatorial Central Africa, um, all these subtypes or clades are present in the population. So it looks a bit as if it could have started in this region and that um, people took the A strain to this area, A and D strain to this area, C strain to this area, interesting connections between South Africa and India. Uh, the B went to, uh, probably actually to Haiti, um, and then into the United States and into the West. And these subtypes have tended to remain fairly true, so once the this sort of quarter pounder effect. Once the B clade has started here, then all the people who are getting infected are infected with the B clade. And down here, the C is dominant. The C seems to be more aggressive than the others. So <coughs> there's some people think the C is beginning to replace the A and the D in this area. Um, the first virus from 1959 was actually already in the D clade. So this split had already occurred at that time. So it looks as if it started 
before 1959. And from these trees, you can actually sort of go back to estimate when the thing might have started in humans. And you can go back into probably the, the 30s or 40s, perhaps. Um, and then it spread dramatically from the 80s, um, 70s and 80s onwards. Um, now, where did it come from before that? Um, well, it turns out that um, monkeys um, have viruses very similar to HIV. So there's, there's a simian uh, immunodeficiency virus, which is SIV. And this is common in African green monkeys, sooty mangabees, and there's a version of it in chimpanzees and gorillas. Um, it's been in these, you can estimate that it's been in these species for many millennia. And it tends not to cause disease in these species. So it's almost as if, and it, the, the guess is that actually the two have adju adjusted to each other. So, um, because when you, when you take it out of, um, say, a sooty manga bee, um, or an uh, African green monkey and put it in an Asian related kind of monkey, a macaque, um, they develop AIDS, exactly like um, AIDS. And in fact, you can show it for Phil's postulates. So these animals have not been exposed to it for thousands of years. Um, and so it goes into a new species, it causes trouble. Um, and that's, that's not unusual, actually, with zoonoses, so with infections that are in animal species moving into other species like humans, um, that they might be fairly trouble-free in the original species, you go into a new species, and they cause havoc. Um, and in fact, uh, there's a version of HIV called HIV-2, which is very, very close to SIV um, sorti, in sooty mangabees, which is a kind of monkey that's common in West Africa. Um, this, in fact, if you, if you just took a sequence from a patient with HIV-2 and showed it to one of these people who looked at these phylogenetic trees and said, where did this come from? They wouldn't be able to tell you whether it was actually human or SIV or from a, from a sooty manga bee. Now, this doesn't mean that people have done sort of crazy things with sooty manga bees. Um, most likely, it could have been someone being bitten because the viruses are in saliva. Uh, it could have been someone killing monkeys um, because people kill monkeys. They, in some places, they kill monkeys for meat. And if they're chopping them up, they could easily cut their fingers. Um, so something like that is probably how it transmitted into humans. Where did... Uh, the, the HIV-1 come from, well, this is a bit like, I always think this is a bit like trying to find the source of the Nile in the 19th century. And it, it, you kind of go around Africa and you're trying to find some sort of non-human primate that has something very close to HIV-1. And the people who do this, um, there's, a, there's a woman called Martine Peters in, in France, or well, comes from France, and uh, Beatrice Hahn in the USA who, who really led this and they, they set up expeditions which go, go into these equatorial areas and they collect feces from chimpanzees. So they don't have to actually go and bleed the chimpanzees. They can get it from their droppings. And they then send those to Birmingham, Alabama, where, where Beatrice Hahn works. And she can isolate the virus from the feces. And she can look and then sequence it and see if it's how closely related it is to HIV-1. And doing this... Um, they've come up with a version of the virus in, in Cam either Cameroon or Gabon, which is very, very close to HIV-1. And is they're, they're, uh, they, they might find a closer one still as they keep searching, but they're very close to finding um, where this virus came from. And it was transmitted from humans, actually, uh, sorry, from uh, chimpanzees to humans, it was also transmitted from chimpanzees to gorillas. And these um, primates fight each other. So uh, it's quite possible that's how that might have happened. And of course, when the virus goes into a new species, then it, it causes disease, and in this case, AIDS. So these, these are the sort of phylogenetic trees of the different uh, SIVs. So 
Um, here's HIV-1. This is the human infection, these viruses here. And there, the closest relative is this one here, which is a chimpanzee SIV from Gabon. And Gabon is, um, I didn't know this till I looked up this slide, it's here. And it's close to Cameroon and southern Cameroon. So this area is where the, the, the um, transmission is most likely to have first occurred. Um, and then if you look further away, further distance, because it's now quite a long distance to get around to some of these, um, these are the SIV, the, the HIV-2. So, so in the um, uh, macaques um, and in HIV-2 and somewhere the sooty mangabe virus. So um, these are sort of separate branch from HIV-1 and the chimpanzee viruses. The chimpanzee viruses are very close to the human HIV ones. So it, it looks like it came from chimpanzees um, into humans. And chimpanzees, unfortunately, uh, have been killed uh, for meat in, in these areas, bush meat. And that's probably what happened. But there's a sort of interesting question then is, is these practices have probably been going on forever. So, so why did it take off now? And it's suspected there may be some some unlucky um, genetic feature um, in one in one of the genes um, of the virus that went into humans this way, and that allowed it to grow properly and and explode in humans. Whereas, and that was probably an extremely rare event, which just happened in in the 1950s, maybe. Um, whereas in previous occasions, it may have transmitted to humans, it might have caused trouble, but it never really spread. And so, um, and then the other things that have happened in, in this sort of last half of the last century in these areas in Africa is huge changes of um, decolonization and road building and minerals and oils and so forth. And you can blame whoever you like for all that civil wars. Um, which have moved people around and um, have probably aggravated <coughs> the, <coughs> the spread of these things. So that's probably where it came from. And, and <coughs> the relatedness of this virus to the chimpanzee viruses um, and puts it in a sort of broader biological context. So this is something that's common in primates. Humans had been quite free of it until fairly recently, and now it's um, become a problem in humans. Well, this, this um, here we go. This is um, the sort of current, well, fairly current situation that it, there's a lot of this in Africa. Um, it is present in almost everywhere else, but at varying levels. And um, it does still raise the question why, why it's such a problem in Africa. And um, it may be because the strains, <laughs> strains there are more aggressive. It may be to do with, with all the sort of social and cultural things of, of how people interact. Uh, it's almost certainly aggravated by, by poverty and, and other um, sort of events like civil wars and so forth. Um, it's also probably true that once you get to about 5% in the population, then it just explodes. So if, you, if, you, if it's staying below 1% or below perhaps 5%, then it never really takes off in this sort of way. But once it gets here, then it sort of goes exponential and you get these, this terrible problem they have in Africa. Um, now, another, another argument that the, the dissidents have raised, and do, again, Duisburg, was that um, the, the idea that virus infections cause disease uh, when they infect people um, and then they're eliminated when the immune response comes up. As an immunologist, I'm quite pleased with that. If, if the, that's what the immune response is for. Um, and it gets rid of everything, they reckon. <coughs> this is true with flu and measles and a load of other things. But actually, and, and they never seen... I, I did meet Duisburg in the early 90s, and he, didn't, he never sort of seemed to take this on board, that there are actually many viruses that persist, and the immune response doesn't get rid of them although it may control them. And Epstein-Barr virus is one, uh, which causes glandular fever. And if once you get to about the age of 25, then about um, more than 80%, maybe more than 90% of all adults 
are affected with this. And it's perfectly nicely controlled by the immune response. <coughs> but if you become immunodeficient and you lose that the immune response, uh, they could cause lymphomas. But most of us, the vast majority of us, never have any trouble from this virus. And indeed, although it causes glandular fever, most of us who are infected don't never remember having glandular fever. We might have had a, just a sore throat for a day or two and nothing else. <coughs> Cytomegalovirus is another one. Uh, again, about half of us are infected. Human papillomavirus, um, these are the, the wart viruses, but also the causes of um, cervical cancer and also some um, far pharyngeal cancers. And there's a fantastic new vaccine for this, um, which some of you may have had. Um, it should be given to women as well as men, and young women and men, um, because it will prevent cervical cancer and it will prevent um, pharyngeal cancers. Um, but if you don't have the vaccine and you do become infected, then you have it for life. Hepatitis B virus, similarly, there's a good vaccine, but if you become infected, you have it for life, and it may not cause trouble, but it can cause liver cancer. Hepatitis C virus is another one, it's the same. Well, same diseases. Herpes simplex, some of you may have cold sores from time to time. Um, it's a persisting herpes virus. It's pretty benign, but although it can sometimes cause trouble. Uh, chicken pox, uh, now, most of you probably had chicken pox, and many of you will probably still be infected with it, but it's sitting very quiescent. But it might suddenly flare up sometime as, as uh, shingles. Um, but mostly the immune response is controlling all these. And TB, some of, some of, some of you may, may have TB, but you're not suffering from TB. You're affected with this, but you're controlling it with your immune response. <coughs> so HIV could be similar to those, but actually it undermines the immune responses that control it. And it does this by, by mutating and escaping from immune responses. And at the same time, it's actually attacking the immune system itself. So I'll show you one piece of data, which is this. So this is a patient infected with HIV. And at the time of infection, the virus is represented by this line here. And it's homogeneous virus that infects every patient who gets infected, just one virus. Um, this is the genomic composition of the virus, and so this is just representing the sequence across that, sequence and uh, nucleotides. But if you follow what happens in this patient 14 days later, there start to be mutations represented by these dots, these red dots. And they're not just, and each one of these is a different virus that's been sequenced at this time. And these changes are occurring in all the sequences, so they're not random. Um, they're being, in fact, they're being selected by the immune response and they're escaping the immune response. So there's an immune response that saw this bit of the virus and the virus changes and that immune response is negated. And it's happened here as well and it's here. And as then it goes on, only another 18 days later, it, there's more changes occurring. Hun uh, what, 70 days after that, more and more, and it goes on, it gets more and more and more complicated, but it's just every immune response that's thrown at this virus, it just escapes it. And that's something that doesn't happen with most other viruses and infections. And it's just the way the virus is, that it, it is set up that it can do this. And this is why the immune response cannot control this virus on its own. So that's a sort of picture of the infection. Um, and it's a, it's a sort of a series of answers to, to the dissident questions. Um, but I, I fully admit there are some un, unanswered questions. So um, I've touched on this. We don't really know why it's worse in Africa. We've got theories, and we may know part of this, but I'm not sure we know the whole of this. <coughs> I think it's that these viruses are more aggressive, these ones, than this one, which is in the West. Um, it seemed they seem to be particularly good at heterosexual spread, um, and we don't really know why. Um, poverty undoubtedly makes it worse, makes everything worse. Um, 
TB co-infection, this is really common. M most patients in Africa, uh, if they become infected, they actually present in the hospital with TB. And if you go to an African hospital, um, you'll see a lot of people coming in with TB and the clinical staff immediately test for HIV and it's nearly always positive. So the immune dysfunction that the HIV is causing is causing a flare-up of TB. And that actually might be making the whole thing worse because TB is not a trivial disease. It's a serious problem. Uh, <coughs> and then there may be different risk factors in terms of exposures and, and maybe other sexually transmitted diseases, um, et cetera, that, that probably need to be fully explored. So that's one thing we don't know. We don't fully understand this bystander activation whereby a lot of lymphocytes who are not infected by HIV sort of divide and grow and then die. And that accounts for quite a lot of the loss of the lymphocytes in the body. We don't fully understand that. <coughs> <coughs> and then we don't completely understand why the SIVs um, may cause much less severe or even no disease in the monkeys they infect. And this is probably something that's been selected over time in sort of evolutionary manner, um, over tens or hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and we don't really understand why that is. Um, but we do know humans haven't evolved to, to do that. If, if it was left on its own, eventually we'd probably get to that situation. Um, but it would cause a lot of trouble in the meantime. So the last thing is then just skepticism v. denialism. So you're all skeptics in this society, which is great. Um, and, and you raise questions that should be answered. Um, so um, and most of us have been skeptical about one thing, so, or, or more. So I was skeptical of global warming at one time, but I'm convinced now, I change my mind. I was skeptical that there were cells called dendritic cells 30 years ago. And um, a friend of mine who sadly died two days before um, it was announced uh, won the Nobel Prize for discovering those. And I've changed my mind. I believe that, um, et cetera. Um, and it's part of normal science to be skeptic and indeed life. But you need to be able to change your mind when you, you're convinced by the evidence. Um, the denialists seem to have closed minds. Um, they may be religious extremists, political extremists, it may be driven by fear and ignorance, and they may just want publicity or just be plain malignant. Um, and you, you know, we can, it's more to do with psychology, which I don't know anything about, um, than this, but it's, they're out there and you, we've all met it. Um, but this is fine. Um, so these were the arguments, and I think we've hopefully um, dealt with most of those, plus a few other things. I think that's my last slide, so I'm very happy to take questions and discussion. <laughs>